Dr. Sean Baker, thank you very much for joining me for a chat today. Yeah, James. Hey, man, it's a pleasure. Awesome. It's good to good to good to talk to folks down down in your part of the world. So, uh, you know, don't get to see each other very often. But I lived down I lived down there in New Zealand for for um, uh, about two years back in the early 1990s. But I never made it across to Australia, so it's still on my on my to do list. It's a fantastic place, and it's uh, probably one of the world's best kept secrets. So maybe we don't tell too many people who do like it. <laughs> Are you originally from there? I'm British. So I was, was going to say, I was going to, because when I heard you, I've heard you, I said, he sounded like he's UK. And then I was surprised when this, this came from Australia. I was like, I thought he was a UK guy. But okay. I came here backpacking and then I never left, which is what is the story for a lot of English and Irish people. Yeah, well, I mean, the weather, gosh, you know, I mean, you can, you can go to nice sunny, sunny beaches versus, you know, the UK weather. <laughs> I've been following you for quite some time on uh, Twitter. And one thing that I've really enjoyed is that none of your posts, I've always known your standpoint of being very pro carnivore. But you, you're not a zealot with it. You're not too much. You're not in my face. You're never saying to me, you know, holding a, a bunch of vegetables going, these are going to kill me. Right. And I've been going through a phase in my life where I'm starting to challenge myself on things I could be wrong with. So I saw one of your tweets the other day and I was like, we need to talk. Yeah, so sure. Well, thank you for the opportunity. And I, I'll just, just piggyback on that. And yes, I mean, I'm a physician, right? And my interest solely is I see people getting better by doing this crazy elimination dot, whatever, you know, we call it carnivore, whatever you want to call it. And that's what, that's really what my sole interest. When I see people with multiple sclerosis or Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis or severe depression, and they get rid of that, to me, that's super exciting. And that's why I'm out here sharing this and trying to get, you know, hey, you know, jumping up down. So I say, hey, somebody look over here. There's something really going on here. And, you know, we don't have to extrapolate it to the whole population and say, everybody needs to be on a carnivore diet or vegetables going to kill you. And that's nonsense. I mean, you get in this liver king stuff where you're just turning it into a spectacle when really it's just, uh, it, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, in my view, it's a viable, um, you know, methodology to deal with disease. And, you know, if some people want to try it, you know, there, there's various reasons. Some people have various level of sickness. If you're super healthy and you're doing great, hey, just keep doing what you're doing. I mean, there's no reason to change it. Um, you know, and I think some of it, you know, and again, age has something to do with this. I mean, most of the people that I see doing this 40, 50, 60 years of age, you know, they're the people that are sick. You know, they, they've, they've suffered from decades of eating garbage, you know, quite honestly. I mean, that's most of our food you can, you can pretty accurately describe is, is kind of garbagey and it, it, it takes its toll. And, you know, I'm in my, I'm in my late fifties and, you know, I'm, I'm very fortunate that I mean, I'm, 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 I take care of myself. I exercise. I'm not eating a meat based diet because I want to give myself a car, a heart attack. I mean, I do it honestly because it gives me the best per, per, perception of health that I've ever had both subjectively and objectively. And so, so, yeah, I'm not very zealous about it. I, I don't care what people. If you want to eat a vegan diet, good for you. I mean, go for you. If it, if it works for you, great. The problem that I have is when people start, just like you said, when they tell me I have to do this or, you know, you know what you're doing is, is wrong and bad. And I'm like, well, how is it bad if people are getting healthier? And I think that's that's something that we should be open to. And, and, and I applaud you for, you know, saying, hey, let's see what happens. I mean, it could be fun. You know, you never know. You may, you may feel great. You may feel no different. You may feel worse. But you don't know till you try. Because I know uh, I did a podcast with Michaela Peterson, and I know for a fact that she has changed her life significantly for the better from going uh, just onto red meat and Jordan Peterson as well. And people actually use it as a way of discrediting their almost intelligence. They're like, oh, you mean the guy that just eats red meat? And you're like, well, what's someone's dietary preference or, you know, dietary standpoints got to do with their reputation it's almost like people are trying to slander them for only eating meat it's a very strange world we live in what is and you know i mean it's really i mean it's contextual based because if, if i were to go to say rural mongolia and say hey, i'm just eating meat they'd be like okay that's tuesday i mean it's just you know in the context of this current you know hyper processed food society where we can go to the grocery store and pick out 20,000 different ingredients. And even, you know, even 100 years ago, that didn't exist. I mean, you had a few things that grew, grew locally, a few animals, you know, meat, eggs, chicken, some dairy, and whatever sort of vegetables and fruits grew in the local area before we had this massive capacity to transport food all over the world, hyper processes. Now we have, you know, Reese's peanut butter flavored cereal. And I mean, it's just, it's just unending choices that we have now. And so if you say, I'm going to restrict myself to a few items, you're, 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 you're crazy. And, and, you know, I, I, I don't do this for any reason other than I prefer to feel good, you know, health wise. I mean, it, maybe it's selfish in that regard, but I mean, why, why not? I mean, why would you prefer, you know, and again, I get it. It's like life has a lot of, a lot of uh, options for us. 
and you know, could I do different things? And, I, and I, I'll I'll tell you, I've been doing this for now. This is my seventh year I've been doing this, and I probably over the last. Um, you know, I, I made, made this statement before, probably six or 7,000 steaks. I mean, I eat it all the time. It's wonderful. I'm very blessed that I can even afford to do it. And I live in a country where it's possible. But, I mean, sometimes I'll have some eggs. Sometimes I'll have some dairy. Every once in a while, I'll just have a piece of cake. I'm like, whatever. You know, I'd say I'm, I'm not really – it's not a religion. It's not like, you know, where you have the, the sort of the opposite end of the spectrum where you have the vegan, vegan ideology and how dare you eat an egg. You know, how dare you? I mean, my gosh, you, you're evil – animal abuser. I don't really care. I mean, just, just do what works for you. And I mean, I think that is something that, you know, we should separate that because I, I, I get a lot of, I cringe from a lot of carnivores. I see them saying stuff online. I'm like, Oh my God, you know, it's almost, it's almost, you know, kind of, I get a little embarrassed by when people come out there and say, all oh, vegetables are going to kill you and it's poison. And, you know, you got to be, and, and, you know, I was just in a, a documentary on vice and, you know, they, they picked me and then they put some guy that's eating raw testicles all day, every day. He calls himself the testicle king. You know, it's kind of a knockoff of the liver king. And it's just like, that's just nonsense stuff. You don't need to do that. I mean, that's, all that is is social media clickbait, right? It's just trying to drive eyes on you. And, it, you know, again, at the end of the day, it's like, let's get people healthy. Because I don't know about you, I don't like being in a society where everybody's sick, where everybody's obese, everybody's depressed, when 25% of the population is on some sort of psychiatric medication. That's a scary position to be in. And I think... You know, and, and, and to your credit, too, I mean, once, you know, we have this health care system, which is and, and food system, which is wildly corrupted. I mean, there's conflicts of interest. Uh, they have no interest in being people being healthy. The pharmaceutical companies don't. They have interest in people being on medication. Uh, that, that suits their bottom line. But when you're out there telling people, hey, get out in the sun, get some exercise, clean up your diet, stop eating processed garbage. You're doing a tremendous service, you know, as you have a social media reach, you know, a pretty significant that Im- impacts a lot of people's lives, and it's doing the work that we're failing to do as as physicians, as governments, as healthcare uh, agencies. And so, I mean, it's I mean, it's a different, it's a weird time we live in. It's interesting that we kind of look at diet. Well, I look at the diet or nutritional guidelines or whatever as almost like a political spectrum. And I see like far left being vegans and almost far right being people that are carnivore. But to me, there's this interesting distinguishing notion that. There are people that maybe are on this left vegan, you know, meat free. It's more of like a, you know, they'll say it happily. It's an ethical thing. But I think where there's strong ethics with your diet comes almost a cognitive dissonance where you're going to happily, subjectively feel shit and worse, potentially and malnourished. But you're going to keep riding the crusade under the guise of being ethically superior to people. Whereas it doesn't make sense for people to anecdotally report a meat only diet being far superior for their health, well being and everything. There's there's no, you know, buy in and I'm pretty sure that most people that eat a meat only diet probably do love animals, do care about animal welfare, but they're doing something that feels good for them as far as their their body and their feeling. Whereas I can imagine a lot of people on the vegan side of things are gonna say they feel great when they don't because they are um, you know, looking for this this world of moral virtue which i think can muddy the water of people's uh you know experiences with these diets uh yes i mean i have no i'm not making any kind of ethical or moral statement by the diet I'm, i'm choosing the diet that i eat because it honestly gives me the best perception of health that i've had and and i've seen it i've gotten i mean literally i've taken care of directly you know as as through consulting a lot, probably hundreds of vegans that have found out for whatever reason, maybe five years in, 10 years in, some 30, 30, 40 years into it. They're like, it just, it just wrecked me. And now it's not to say that no one can survive on a vegan diet and even thrive on it because clearly there's examples of that as well. But um, to say that, and I see a lot of them, they'll say, you know, when their health starts to fail, they'll say, well, it's not about health. It's about the animals. And when you really look at food production systems, it doesn't matter what you're eating. I mean, there, there's going to be animal death across the board, and they'll, they'll say, well, maybe there's slightly more with animal agriculture, and that's debatable depending on how the animal's raised. So you get in this position where, well, it's okay for animals to die for me to eat, but I like these ones to die and not these ones, or, you know, maybe you're killing 10% more than me, and therefore I'm, maybe I'm 10% incrementally better than you. I don't know. I mean, it's, it's really, you know, it, it gets into a lot of different, different uh, ethical topics and i just don't think ethics should should be a big part of human nutrition i mean human nutrition should be based on 
what provides the best nutrition for humans. I mean, as, as silly as, and simplistic as that sounds. And, uh, you know, I know we're in, we live in a time where there's such technology where we can start to make uh, proteins out of, you know, uh, my, you know, fungi and potato stuff, you know, potato, you know, hyper processed to where we can start to piece together the, the amino acids and try to get a, a you know, a reasonable facsimile of what we, what we naturally get from meat. You know, one of the things I look at is, you know, as we all know that meat has complete nutrition when it comes to the protein side. I mean, the amino acid uh, concentrations, the amounts of leucine, the other, you know, branch chain amino acids, whatever, the indispensable amino acids are in the perfect blend for what we need as human beings. And there's a reason for that. I mean, it's because we basically evolve doing this. And I think that's that's why we need that. And so you can try to uh, get around it with technology. But again, you know, there's, there's an interesting researcher by the name of Stefan von Vliet. He was out of Duke University. He's now, I believe, at Utah State. And he's looking, he, you know, he's analyzing what is actually in meat. And it's not just, you know, essential amino acids and some fat and some vitamins and minerals. There's something like 70,000 unique compounds, most of which we have no idea what they do yet. And we're still learning all the time. And so when we try to make that by sticking this, you know, beyond burger, you know, impossible patty with, you know, they've done a direct comparison. There's only about 10% overlap in the compounds. So 90% of what's in meat is not in these facsimiles, which, you know, are being held to, held up as, as a replacement. You can just eat this instead. Well, you know, you can, you can, you can get calories. I mean, everybody is already so sick. Everybody is already, you know, I mean, I don't, I don't know how bad it is in Australia, but in the U.S. particularly, I don't know if you've been here, but, you know, we, we're at, we're at 42% obesity rate, which is, I mean, it's mind boggling that 42% of the, the, the Americans in the United, right now are clinically obese. And, and another 30 some percent are, are overweight on top of that. So we're, you know, we have, we, we have only some like 25% of our population that is not overweight, which is, it's astounding. To th- and and that, that's happened in the last, you know, 30 years, which is just, it is really insane how that's, that's occurred. I think it's important that when you're going to present something for someone to try, that their buy-in isn't too extreme. And for me, when I was considering this, and, you know, Joe Rogan's been a big advocate and I've got a lot of respect for Joe when he, you know, there are some things with him where I think always oh, he's been taken away a little bit on a podcast there and he's got, but generally he is a walking, talking encapsulation of like a, a good balance, good diet, you know, uh, very consistent with the things he does. He pays due diligence to everything and he reports feeling amazing. And I'm like, this guy's not a bullshit. You know, he can't be bought. He's not going to sit down and accept anything that's rubbish. And I thought to myself, what, so... I could live the life I'm living. Part of it, you know, the idea of giving up, you know, vegetables or eradicating those, I was like, this makes my life easier. Because when I'm barbecuing, I'm like, right, what, I'll spend t- five, ten minutes thinking about what meat I'm going to have. Then I'm thinking, oh, I might put an egg on that. And then I'm thinking, oh, fuck, what vegetables am I going to have? And I'm there and I'm looking through them. I'm like, oh, I'm bored of broccoli. I'll go on and get some. And I'm not eating vegetables because I like them. I'm eating them because right. of, you know, the way that, I know they're going to help with digestion and I've seen the studies of like all case mortality, but the idea of going carnivore, although I'm going to have to leave something behind like cereal that I cherish and bread wraps that I like putting things into, it's almost a more middle ground than I thought because I'm not going to have to cognitively think so much. And there are some things I'm worried about. I'm worried that I'm going to get sick of meat or sick of steak or bored of it. And you know, I'm like, what am I going to, what if I come out the other side and I'm sick of steak? How's that going to help me? What are the, you know, the parameters? Let's say we've got a few hundred men and women listening to this and they go, do you know what? This sounds compelling. I'm going to give it a go. What are kind of your do's and don'ts when it comes to uh, choosing a, a meat only or a carnivore diet? And where is there the leeway that people can have their cake and eat it? Right, right. Well, I think first of all, you have to. We have to realize who's doing it. Now, if you're doing it and you 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 you're severely ill and you have a lot of medical issues, I mean, honestly, you should probably do it in conjunction with a physician because some of the like you know, if you're on diabetic medications or hypertensive medications, going on this diet can rapidly impact that change that in in a good way. But then you then you're taking too much medication, you can have issues. So that's first a disclaimer I, I put out there, and that's why we we started a company. We're, we're, we're licensed in all 50 states to take patients that we can help them transition to. And not only carnivore diet, we're using other nutrition. It's just one tool in the tool basket. But um, so I think, you know, what I tell people is, you know, if, you, if you're doing it to lose weight and, and my, you know, we can have a discussion on what we think is causing people to gain, like why, why we have the obesity crisis. I think it has to do clearly with the food. It's not, 
as some of these Ozempic manufacturers, you know, the new weight loss drugs saying it's all genetics, right? I mean, the genetics didn't change in the last 50 years. I mean, the, the, the fat dogs and cats that we have in the house, their genetics didn't change. They're just eating crap food. So, I mean, it's like how do you get away from not wanting that stuff? Because it's everywhere, and it tastes good, and it's cheap, and everybody wants you to do it, and everybody's doing it. It's like being, you know, like being the only guy in a, in a, in a society of heroin addicts, and you're like, well, I don't want to do heroin. This is kind of weird. Um, but I think that for what I, what I tell people, you know, you know from, from a craving standpoint, because, you know, they'll, they'll likely come some point in there, maybe three days in, maybe two weeks in. You just eat enough. You just eat to, eat to full satiety. I mean, the nice thing about this diet for most people, not all people, but mo- for most people, you know, we have to – if we look at any animal that's in the wild, they just eat. They don't track. They're not, they don't have an app. They don't have a – you know, they don't have a Fitbit. They don't have a, a you know, a macro calculator. There's – eat their normal crap and they stay healthy and they live a normal life and they're not obese. Humans, on the other hand, we're now at a point where we're logging everything and we're calculating everything down to the milligram. And it's just kind of, you know, why would it be like that? Why not just have food you can eat and don't have to worry about it? And generally that's what happens to a lot of people. And they, and they like the simplicity of that. And you're exactly right. I spend all of about three minutes a day thinking about what I'm eating. It's usually me opening the refrigerator and saying, huh, what steak do I want? And I pull out a couple of steaks and I throw them in, you know, throw them in. The, I usually like to sous vide stuff and then I, then I sear them. But, so, I mean, my, my total time I dedicate to eating is minimal. I mean, it's probably 20, you know, including the time it takes me to eat, I spend about 30 minutes a day eating, you know, including prep time and, and all that stuff, thinking about it, which is a big shock because most of us, you know, maybe eating three meals a day plus two or three snacks, we're constantly thinking about meals, constantly preparing meals, constantly shopping for meals, constantly looking at recipes. And so it's very freeing in, in that regard. But I think that one, you enjoy it. I mean, any, like like, for instance, if you're on a, dietary plan. And I don't tell people to think of this as this is what I'm going to do the rest of my life. Who knows? I don't even know if I'm going to do it the rest of my life. I never say I'm always going to, because I hear people, they'll do it for three months. They say, oh my God, it's the best I felt in my whole life. I'm never switching. I said, don't say never, because you never know what's going to happen, right? You know, you see that. I mean, six years from now, who knows what's going to happen. So um, so I tell people, enjoy it. I mean, enjoy the hell out of it. You should, you should not dread what you're eating. You know, like I said, if you um, in the beginning for a lot of people, and some people have tolerant issues with dairy and some pe- have, people have issues with spices and things like that. But in the beginning, if you don't have like some severe autoimmune issue or Crohn's disease or something like that, put some spice on your food, mix it up, eat different cuts of meat, even, eat, you know, eat different, eat chicken, eat pork, eat shrimp, eat, you know, eat beef, eat kangaroo, you know, where you guys are, eat, you know, you got lamb all over the place. I mean, all these great options, fish, um, you can use dairy as, as a, as a, as a condiment. I know some people, have, you know, positive or negative experiences with dairy. Um, and then just enjoy the hell out of it. You should enjoy every meal. I mean, that, that that's my goal. And I do. I mean, even though it's often the same thing, if I sit down and have a ribeye steak for breakfast and a ribeye steak for dinner, I, I enjoy those steaks. I guarantee it. Um, I'm, I'm kind of, I kind of like my dogs. My dogs eat the same crap every day. I mean, they get meat. My dogs are on hundred percent meat based diet, but they are they're dancing. I mean, they're, they're drooling and jumping up and down. And it's, it's kind of interesting because you actually, once you're hungry enough and, you know, you, you find a lot of people, you know, will see that their, their meal frequency will decrease to, to, to usually twice a day. That's pretty common for most people. They'll eat a big breakfast or a big lunch, depending. Some people like to skip breakfast. And then they'll, they'll often eat another meal later in the day. That's, that's, that's typically what happens. But um, I would just have fun with it. I would, you know, enjoy the hell out of it. You know, if you don't know how to cook, shame on you because you should. This is a skill that uh, is killing people, the lack of knowing how to cook because we need to rely on convenience food. I saw a survey uh, two years ago. I was looking at, I think, the millennial generation. They said they're not eating breakfast cereal anymore. Why, Why aren't they eating breakfast cereal? I thought, well, maybe it's because they're realizing it's all a bunch of, you know, just sugar covered garbage, right? And so no one's eating. But, but that wasn't the reason. The reason was it was too much work. They had to actually rinse a bowl out. You know, there's milk in the bowl. You have to put it in the dishwasher. So they wanted a package they could rip open instead. So we can open, rip open a granola bar and shove it in our mouth. And so that has been the demise of a uh, breakfast cereal for some reason. So I think, you know, have a lot of variety, enjoy it, have fun with it, eat, eat, eat as much as you want. I mean, I think that's, now, you may not lose weight that way. Some people do just because spontaneously their appetite is suppressed and they lose weight, particularly if they have weight to lose. But uh, one of the things is you're, you know, you're an athletic fit guy, you're pretty lean. You may actually lose some weight that you don't want to because it's like, you know, you know one, of the, one of the things of why carbohydrates are beneficial for, for muscle building is it's easier to get into caloric surplus. I mean, this is like, you know, I don't, you know, I don't know if you're, you know, Stan Efforting who has a vertical diet and I know Stan pretty well. And we talked about it and he said, you know, the reason I have everybody eating rice and I put dextrose in the rice because I get these big, 
three hundred pound plus strong man, and I got them get them to eat all the time, and they don't want to eat all the time if if it's if there isn't that that you know that type of food in there. So one of the things on a meat only diet, a lot of people spontaneously lose, lose weight just because of the appetite suppression. So it's you know it's easy to get pretty lean, but if that's not what you want, you want to hang on to weight, then you have to kind of it becomes a job. It's like, oh, I got to eat another meal even though I'm not hungry. And, you know, I mean, if you've spent time putting on muscle, you know. I mean, you just – bodybuilders are always eating, and, and they're not enjoying it a lot of time. They're just shoving it in because that's what it takes to, to have this unnatural amount of muscle mass. Yeah, protein can really kill your satiety. And yeah. even if you don't want it to, even if you like your meal prep for the day, it does – it almost kills the creativity of your mind that wants to wander off and think about uh, hedonic foods. It's interesting you say there about uh, a Zempic because – I've been stumped recently when it's coming up with good YouTube ideas. I've uh, I studied a YouTube course and re- realized that my video ideas were quite shit. So I was like, my first idea was I was going to document doing a Zempic for maybe a month or six weeks. So I uh, went online, did a script, lied to a doctor, got prescribed it. And just before I was about to go pick up my prescription, I started looking at the side effects. Yeah. And I was like, fucking hell. Like... People say to me now, oh, would you recommend, you know, uh, fat loss drugs? I believe it's got different uh, names uh, in different countries. But ultimately, if you're going to die, I completely get behind you. And I know a lot of doctors in uh, America uh, are really championing it. But then some of the side effects were like, you know, depression, ligament issues, uh, muscle. And I was like, if I popped my shoulder or did my knee in a fat loss YouTube video, I'd be absolutely livid. But like you say, it's almost like one of the first points of call now is is to medicate with some form of drug rather than dramatically altering habits. And you said there about people tracking their calories. And I suppose that's been such a big tool for me with clients because I need something. If I can't alter what they're, what they're eating, I need a tool like a bolt-on. And it's not really a change, it's a bolt-on that's going to alter those things. But when you say, you know, rapidly changing someone's diet, and I think what could be exciting for some people is the simplicity of it. And I know over the years, some people have got results from low carb because my nan knows what a carb is. You know, she, she suddenly goes bread, pasta, potato, cakes, chocolate, ice cream, can't have that carbohydrates. And even someone not even well-versed in nutrition can really grasp that quite easy in the same way with, you would say to someone, hey, I want you to eat 80, 90% meat every day. Someone goes, do you want some cereal, do you want some cake? They know already they can't eat that. They don't need to know about, you know, insulin or they don't need to know about uh, different roles in the body or mitochondria. They just know that they can't have the foods that probably alluded to them overeating in the first place. Um, but yeah, it, it's something that for so many people could be a viable tool for them to trial out and to see how they feel. And this again, I know that even having this conversation with you, some people are going to say, oh, but you've, you've taken the piss out of carnivore before. And I have. I've said, yeah, it's a great diet. Just add vegetables. But it, it's one of those things where I'm now in a stage where I'm like, surely all of us are in a position to trial something. So that, you know, I've, I've seen what people have said. I follow closely the Lane Nortons, the Aaron Aragons, you know, the Ben Carpenters. But I was like, have I done this myself? One thing I'm doing at the moment is I'm doing ice baths. After chatting rubbish about ice baths for years, I've kind of seen the science just bubbling up and I was like it would be better to rip into this after doing a month of ice baths than it would be to just stand on the sideline and and have a pop um where does fruit sit within this because I know that Rogan's very pro carnivore with fruit right yeah so I think that it depends on the person you know I mean I you know to, to call that you know I guess the spirit of a carnivore diet would be you know basically no plant products basically but Fruit is a you know, whole food. I mean, it's it's head and shoulders above most of the processed food out there. Uh, you know, if you are relatively metabolically healthy, then then it's probably fine. I mean, there's there's you know, I mean, it's clear. I you know, even in my book, the carnivore diet, I don't say we're carnivores. I say we were opportunistic omnivores, and we had periods of time where we we, we experienced a lot of carnivory. And it's it's really a protocol. It's not a a belief system about what humans are or were not. I mean, clearly we had access to fruit. Clearly, you know, if you believe in an evolutionary model, you know, at, at one point we were, quote unquote, monkeys in trees eating fruit. Now, the problem with that, you know, sort of evolution is that they're still on the, they're still in the trees as monkeys eating fruit and their brain hadn't gotten any bigger. So there was a point, there was a shift that happened, a dietary shift, and that was driven by, you know, some, some changes in the, in the climate and, the, and the, the, the landscape where the forest went away and the grasslands sort of developed and, and we developed, you know, we, we ended up, you know, scavenging and then hunting. But... The fruit thing is one of those things where 
Um, I think it's great for a lot of people. A lot of people, and probably yourself, you probably do quite well on that. You know, that that's something because, you, you know, from what I can tell, you're not struggling metabolically. You're not obese. I mean, I, to my knowledge, you don't have any autoimmune issues or diseases. And so that could probably be a very good thing to do. I think one of the lessons a lot of people that do, and this is, I think, and I applaud you for trying it because there's a lot of people that have talked about the negatives of carnivore diet. They've never done it. They've never experienced what I, I've experienced personally. And, and more importantly, the tens now, tens of thousands of people that I've seen that have transferred them lives. I've got people that were suicidally depressed, bed bound, you know, with multiple sclerosis. Now they're walking them back to work. I mean, that stuff just doesn't happen normally um, on a regular basis. And I'm seeing it on a regular basis now. So I think it's important to at least, you know, like, like whether you can say, hey, there's problems. These are the problems I see with that. And, you know, obviously you're going to have a change in your, you know, your, your digestive system. You're not going to be putting any fiber through there. A lot of people have big heart heartburn about that. Oh, my God, you're not going to be able to the bathroom. Well, you find out, well, actually you can. It's fine. It's not a big deal for most people. You know, it's one of those things. I have a regular bowel movement pretty much every day. It's not, you know, you, you adjust to this stuff. You adapt to it. It's like, you know, I mean, we're not lions or anything else, but, I mean, you know, a, a cat goes to the bathroom, right? They have no problem. Anybody that a cat knows that. Uh, so without fiber. So you can, you can certainly um, – debunk some things for yourself. You know, what's going to happen to me? When I when I first did this in 2016, I was I had a small Twitter following, uh, a couple thousand people. Now I'm, you know, a couple hundred thousand in there. But I said, hey, I'm going to do this crazy, stupid carnivore diet. I thought it was crazy at the time, too. I was like, oh, my God, you know, what am I, what's, what am I going to die of? Because clearly I'm going to die, right? There's no way I'm going to make a month of this. My heart's going to either clog up from all the saturated fat. Uh, I'm going to get scurvy and my teeth are all going to fall out. Or the lack of fiber is going to cause my colon to you know, implode upon itself or something like that. And, and none of that happened. And I got done in 30 days and I was like, and again, I'm, I'm in my fifties. I was, I was just, just before I turned 50 then, and I was a little beat up from being an athlete my whole life and had, you know, aches and pains that you get from, from just, you know, living life and, and particularly if you play hard and all that stuff went away. And I was like, shit, I feel like I'm 30 again. And, and to me, that was like pretty cool. I was like, this is, this is literally the best I felt in, in two decades. And, and that really left an impression on me. And I went back to my more regular diet, you know, I'm the, the more balanced, quote unquote, balanced diet, whole, you know, clean, healthy food, balanced diet. And I immediately felt worse. My digestion was worse. My, you know, my, some of my aches and pains came back. And I was like, well, I don't, I don't really like this. I mean, I don't like being, I don't like being 50 and feeling like I'm 50. I like being 50 and feeling like I'm 30. And I mean, that's, that's why I still do it today. There's another element of this. This is fueled by uh, the fact that I've got a six month your old dog, it's a Kelpie. He's mental. Yeah. He's a working dog. And um, I was feeding him traditional dog food, dry food. Yeah. And then I had a dog training expert on. He said, put him on a raw diet. So then I went down the rabbit hole of feeding dogs a raw diet. And yeah. then I had a raw diet expert on. And he's like, yeah, meat, bones. You know, they need a, a little bit of, you know, uh, secreting organs, liver, all of these things. And then the ratios of them to get them in. And I was feeding him, you know, like sometimes rice, vegetables, meat. I was cooking chicken breasts for him. Then I went through a phase of just giving him raw meat and these solid shits were coming out. He was pissing a lot less. He had these scabs under his armpit as a puppy from his, uh, like, uh, harness that would go on. Everything's gone away. So then I have this nutritional expert on in the dog world and he's like, yeah, when we feed dogs raw diets, their veterinary visits decrease massively. So now I'm on like a crusade trying to get people to feed their dogs right. And then I'm like, hold on a minute. You know, like you say, if your dog is perfectly healthy and it's lived to 18 years eating dry foods, which is like the cereal of the dog world, then I'm not here to dispute that. But if you've got a dog that's recurrently going into the vet, maybe what you put into the dog could change. And everyone's so scared of giving like a raw frozen chicken drumstick to their dog. I'm like, well, Try giving it to them and see how they get on. Try doing it for a week. Try doing it for two weeks. And then I kind of realized paradoxically that I was having that message with people with their dog, but not with their own personal nutrition. But like you say, with um, you have dogs yourselves, like when when you do feed them just like soft meat and a bit of bones, you you can't fathom that the digestive system would put that into a good bowel movement. And like I know Rogan was saying that he was shitting through the eye of a needle when he did it, but like surely. I'm going to survive if I have the shits for a couple of weeks. I mean, I'm probably not going to let my training partners put me in certain positions in jiu-jitsu, but, you know, like, uh, it, it's something that's like part of the journey. And that's now what's going to be one of my YouTube videos is documenting the experience of carnivore. But one of my kind of biggest hesitations with it is I train jiu-jitsu probably six, seven hours a week, but then I'm thinking about it. It's actually not as fast paced, uh, 
as other sports and even with like general weight training where your heart rate doesn't get that high your requirement for carbohydrates is good but i think even having carbohydrates around a workout benefits me psychologically more than anything else coming from an athletic background yourself would you say that a prominent a prominently meat diet is congruent with a good training life and a good performance life yeah, I think so, with, with with few exceptions. And so I don't know if you know, like, like for instance, are you familiar with the concept two rowing machines? You ever done, like, the CrossFit stuff? And you said, yeah, so yeah. I, I set the world record on those. I'm, you know, 500-meter row. At 50 years old, I rode a 114, which is, I mean, I can beat, I could, I could beat legitimate Olympic 2,000-meter rowers over 500 meters, you know. So, I mean, that is obviously very intense. I mean, it's short. I mean, it's aerobic glycolysis, but – or anaerobic glycolysis, rather. But um, what I found is, you know, if you're running a marathon – you know, there, there's a point where you tap out all your glycogen, you know, and if you're, mul- if you're doing multiple workouts a day, let's say you're doing, you're, you're doing cro- CrossFit and you're doing three Metcons a day or something, you're trying to go to the CrossFit games, you're going to have a hard time. But I think for the, for the average person, even relatively uh, high-level athletes, you know, training once a day, maybe twice a day, you'll, you'll have enough, I mean, for the most part. Now, there's an adaptation period. You know, I think the general adaptation to carnivore just for the average person walking around is about three, to, between three and eight weeks. Athletes may take longer, you know, depending on the type of athlete and what they're engaged in and what they've been used to because, you know, your body gets used to whatever you feed it. I mean, your body's going to adapt. I mean, we're very adaptable. And so if you've been used to, you know, uh, carbs before every workout and, you know, you know, 400, 400, 500 grams of carbs a day, that's what you're used to. Your body needs that. And when you stop giving it, it's going to say, whoa, what the hell is going on here? And you're not going to feel very good. And that may take, you know, depending on how long it takes to adapt. It took me probably – um, two to three months, honestly, you know, when I, when I started doing this to, to see, I saw a slight dip in my athletic ability and then it, then it kind of evened out and then it, then it went up. And then I think six months in, I'd set like nine or 10 world records on concept two, just over a period of about a month. I just kept going back and setting a world record and breaking it again and breaking, and breaking it on consecutive days just because I was like, I just felt good. Um, you know, over, over the, again, they're short 500 meters, one minute, 100 meter rows, you know, these, these types of things. Um, and then I do jujitsu as well. I mean, I'm in there a couple nights a week. Uh, I have no problem rolling. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm the oldest guy in the damn gym and I'm going against 20, 25 year old guys. Some of them are pretty damn good wrestlers. And, you know, I have I've had no problem at all doing this, you know, and I think it's just a matter of uh, eating enough. I don't, I don't know if you're familiar with a guy named Mental Henselman. He is a, he's a, he's a guy that's done. Yeah. So he's, he's recently published and he actually published a paper on this looking at, uh, both muscle hypertrophy, strength gains and performance you know, comparing carb, carb, no carb, or it was really like high carb, low carb. So it wasn't, you can't really technically say zero carb, but he found that the carbohydrate, you know, amount in the diet had really no bearing on, on performance or strength gain, at least most of the, the studies that, they, they, that he showed. Now there were some that showed that, but it was, it was kind of a wash where it, it seemed like it didn't make big, a big effect. And so as we have more and more people try this out, I mean, I mean, it's clear, like when it comes to muscle building, it is, you know, it is number one, it's a training. Training is, you got to do the training. I don't care what diet you're on. You got to do the training sufficiently, consistently with the right volume and intensity. And then it's, then of course, protein's in there. So adequate protein, you know, whatever you want to, 2.2 per kilo or whatever number you want to use, 2.6 or 1.6. And then it's just caloric surplus. And I've talked to guys like Don Lehman, Stu Phillips, Jose Antonio, all these, you know, world-class researchers have done the protein research and they've all told me, hey, Carbohydrates are not necessary for muscle protein synthesis. I mean, maybe there's some protection for breakdown. I mean, there's glycogen restoration. Yes, you can you can clearly refor- refill your glycogen tank easier with carbohydrates. But as you go low carb for a period of time, and particularly if you're getting adequate protein, um, you get very efficient at gluconeogenesis over time. So overnight, you wake up the next day, you're good to go. I mean, I I can train super hard on Monday, wake up Tuesday, and train super hard again. Now. Again, if I were trying to do three workouts a day, I probably would like, or if my workouts were two plus hours, and I don't have time for that stuff. I mean, you know, like I said, if I was going to run the Boston Marathon, I probably wouldn't pick this thing. But I mean, jujitsu, working out, getting stronger. I mean, unless you have some aspirations to do ultra long um, endurance based activity or, or you're training like three or four times a day, you should be okay. It's interesting to say that I did see that study from Menno and I think that's one of the things that pushed me over where I was like, and I'd seen pictures of you looking pretty jacked on your Twitter and I was thinking, what's the secret? But then like you allude to there, potentially we we can very easily come to the conclusion that having a high carbohydrate diet could be protein sparing because if you're getting the energy you need from an abundance of carbohydrates, your body's not going to put you in a negative protein balance to you know adjust 
and you say there about uh, gluconeogenesis and the fact that we can convert excess protein into uh, glucose should we need. And that was kind of, for me, that was definitely a bias in my mind that I had to kind of erase because I know Menno is very evidence-based and I've looked up to a lot of his stuff through the years and people like Stu Phillips who, you know, y- there's no dispute in this with, with a lot of people. My, uh, yeah, concern was, you know, oh, how am I going to be in the training room? But then even if I got a dip in performance, is it going to be worth it if I feel better? Because if I'm someone who's, you know, you don't know you feel better until you feel better. You don't, so many people have gone through years of feeling like shit. It's only when they wake up and suddenly they're like, wow, that cloud has lifted from, you know, I thought I was just getting old. And then they clean up their diet a bit and lose a bit of fat and they realize they're feeling a lot better. And, you know, the the jiu-jitsu side of things, the weight room side of things, it'd be interesting. But then at least at the end of, say, a month, two months, I could turn around and say, hey guys, my training dipped by 20%, but I felt, 30 percent better well this is and this is the one thing that i think is important to realize you know if we if we look at it over a period of time let's say you're a fighter getting ready for a fight and you've got a you know a three-month training cycle right um and you know you can go hard you go really hard one day you, you know you take a pre-workout you you know you take 100 grams of carb just something like that or carb load 500 grams a night before and you have a really good workout and you smash it but then you're a little infl- you're a little inflamed and, and the next workout doesn't feel as good or you can't go as hard and and so that adds up if you have you know if you have uh, every third workout is great, and two out of three workouts are kind of subpar. What does that affect over a period of three, three to six months? Whereas, what I find uh, interesting, and, and, and I'm not unique in this, you know, and it's no guarantee it'll happen for you, but I find that my capacity to recover is really, really good. I mean, I remember one, you know, I, I, I'll use an example. I was, you know, when I was 45, I wanted to deadlift 405 pounds, which is what you know, I'll have to do the math on that in kilos. It's you know, 180 kilos or something like that for 20 reps. That was my goal. I wanted to do 20 reps and I could only do it for 15, 16 reps. I would always struggle. And then I went to carnivore when just before I turned 50, the first workout, I mean, well, the first time I tried, I got to 18. Uh, and then I was like, well, let me see if I can do it. And I went back the next day and did it for 20. I mean, with, with, you know, and you know, deadlifting is pretty taxing on the body, obviously, particularly when you're pushing hard, but I was like, yep, I'll just do it again tomorrow. Um, and so, and the same thing, like I, I remember I broke the world record for one minute on concept two in the 50 plus category, I rode, I think 400 and I think the record was like 403 and I rode 408 meters. And I was like, I know I can do better than that. I literally went in the house. I took a shower, ate another steak. I, re- I took a little, like a, a 45 minute nap, hopped back on there again and, and, and bumped that out to, to like four, four, I think four fifteen at the time. So I, you know, I broke the world record twice in one day. So, I mean, it's the recovery is interesting. You know, I think one of the things, you know, what do we do when we sleep, you know, sleep is for us, for us to restore, you know, all, you know, deal with oxidative stress, you know, we have all our antioxidants, you know, with, deal with all the reactive oxygen species that we develop throughout the day. We're also turning over about one to 2% of our muscle mass every day. And so when you have this high quality um, building supplies, you know, I mean, honestly, you know, I mean, it, 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 as simplistic as it sounds, if I'm rebuilding animal cells, where, where do I get the raw ingredients from? Well, if I'm eating a bunch of animal cells, I'm going to get what I need. You know, it's like building a brick house out of bricks versus building a brick house out of straw and mud. One is going to take a lot more effort and it's going to be less efficient. So you're very efficient in your your turnover, your rebuilding phase. And you also don't have as much, you're not as beat up, I find. I mean, I find that, you know, training hard, I don't feel as beat up as I used to when I was on a higher carb diet. And so that may be unique and maybe a consequence of uh, being an older guy, uh, perhaps. And maybe, you know, I don't know how old you are now, James, but I mean, you may not be at that threshold yet. Maybe it's when you turn 40 or whatever, something like that. We're circling back as well, one minute fourteen for a five hundred meter is insane. That's so fast. Yeah, I mean, I'm, well, I mean, I'm a big guy. I mean, obviously, you know, it's, it, it favors being big and tall and strong. And I mean, it's kind of a unique thing. You know, you got to be tall, and it helps to be strong, particularly with the five hundred meter. And you got to be fit too. I mean, you got to have that combination. And you know, like I said, that's. I mean, if you put like, uh, you know, I mean, a lot of the Olympic guys that do two thousand meter. Now, granted, they're they're training for a different distance, but. I can hang with those guys over the 500 meters. Now, 2,000 meters, they, they, I wouldn't even want to attempt it because it's, it's awful. I mean, it's the 2K is just an awful, awful race. In fact, I've never done a legit one. I've just always kind of messed around and never tried to push myself that hard because it looks too miserable. I mean, it looks like, you know, you see people seizing after they're done. You know, they're well, so, I think I've fallen off a brown machine going for a 500 meter. My best is 124. So I'm yeah. 10 seconds behind you. But I remember th- there's no, you, f- you think to yourself as you fall off the brown machine afterwards, why did I do that? Yeah, it is. Yeah. Did you have to get it properly calibrated by concept to be like right? Okay. Uh, well, this- the concept has you know they have this uh, upload uh, uh, 
uh, what do you call it, uh, verification codes and all that stuff. Supposedly they're all calibrated. I mean, I've done I've done it on multiple different machines on you know very similar times. I mean, they're the one thing I do like about Concept Two is all our machines are calibrated, so you can compete all around the world. And you, they have had you know they've been doing they've been in business for something like thirty five years, and they've had competitions every year for years. And I went. I went to the world championships in 2018 and, and won that very easily. I, you know, I, I think it was six seconds faster than the nearest competitor. You know, I think I think I think I wrote like a 117 on that one, which wasn't you know was I wasn't you know wasn't my best, but you know I, the next guy was 123. You know, and this, again, this is a 50. This is the old guys, which is you know <laughs> a little bit a little bit. I'll, I'll, I'll make that concession there. But I mean, I can still I mean, I can beat most guys in their 20s on this. You know, even even some of the top rowers. You know, there's a few guys that are hitting 110, you know, I think the world record now is 110, a guy named Phil Clapp from the UK. But he's six foot ten anyways, you know, he's 22, 21 stone or whatever, you know, I'm, you know, he's a big guy, obviously. Do you, uh, do you ever find the kind of keto community like sliding in and trying to take the the purported benefits and going, oh, no, that's, that's not the meat-only diet, that's because you're in a state of ketosis? Or are we really at a position where the protein would be too high to elicit a state of ketosis? Like when people were to go purely to meat, where does that kind of barrier, is it, is it kind of like a gray area between the two? Because my stance has always been very, don't see the benefits of keto, don't stand with people, you know, trying to get themselves into a state of ketosis for, you know, and I don't even know, you'll know better than me, whether or not, even if they have epilepsy, whether or not it's something as a viable, you know, route to take. Where does this kind of world between carnivore and keto collide? And where do you stand in that kind of position? Yeah, I mean, there, there, obviously, there's there's a lot of similarities. Obviously, there's a, a, a dramatic, dramatic reduction in carbohydrates. Fat is going to be the, the majority of your, your energy. I mean, I eat, you know, a lot of protein. I mean, I eat 300, 400 grams of protein a day, but I'm still getting, you know, 60% of my calories, sometimes 70% of my calories coming from fat, you know, just because that's that's what meat is. I mean, it's, it's mostly fat by calorie. Um, I am rarely, if ever, in ketosis. I mean, I've checked a few times. I don't care. I mean, it's, it's not my goal. I don't care what I don't really care what my ketone levels are. And the other thing is we have to realize that with ketones, it's a product of how much you produce, but also how much you utilize. So if you get very efficient in utilizing those things, either through your brain or your muscle, primarily your brain, then you're not going to show very high levels of ketosis. You know, Verta Health, which is a company founded on putting people in ketosis to treat type 2 diabetes, initially said they were going to check everybody's ketone levels to, 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 to verify compliance. Well, what they found out was the ketone levels kept going down and down and down, and they were like, well, are you changing the diet? Well, no, you just got more efficient at utilizing the things. It's just like... You know, you're, you don't want your blood glucose being 300 milligrams per deciliter, um, you know, you know, even on a high-carb diet. You'd rather it be, you know, in this certain range, and, and our body gets used to that. So when we're efficient and we're, we're insulin sensitive, you know, the glucose we get doesn't hang around. It, goes, it gets out of our system. It's just waste of energy. What, what good does it do? I mean, you know, some people make the comment, well, if I'm peeing off all my glucose and peeing out all my ketones, I'm peeing out energy, and therefore maybe I'm going to lose some weight because of that. But – I am I am not a uh, guy that tells people, yeah, you got to do this and you got to be in ketosis. Now, there's some people within. You, know, you certainly can do a carnivore diet and make it ketogenic. It's just a matter of how frequently you eat, how much exercise you do, how many calories you consume. Uh, you know, the fat to protein ratio will play a role in there. But you know, you can you can be on a high carb diet and still go in ketosis. I mean, it just depends how long you fast in between. I mean, right? You know, you're going to see some ketones in there. So. What I often see is, well, it's not the meat. It's because you cut out the processed food and the garbage. And, and certainly that plays a role in there. There's no doubt about it. But, I mean, because when people, when, when people are critical of that, I'm saying, well, who cares? I don't really, I don't really care why it works. Honestly, I really don't. I'm, I just care that it works. And if it's, if it's because it's higher protein and it's good quality protein and we're not eating junk food and the monotony, and it makes it very easy, it's simple. You know, it's, very, it's a very easy, it's a very, like you mentioned at the beginning, it's a very simple line. It's either made out of meat or it's not. And, you know, when you're because when you're doing like a ketogenic diet or if it's your macros diet, you're always constantly calculating. Well, can I eat this one? How much protein does it have? How many carbs does it have? How much fat does it have? You know, you're this is just it's either meat or it's not, you know, and it's just like, OK, that's that's a pretty easy line. And it's not hard to determine if you're on or off. Whereas, you know, the other thing, the line gets really really fuzzy and it depends on your memory well then i can't maybe and you kind of you kind of intentionally forget things well yeah i forgot about that so you can justify that extra cookie or something like that i mean it's it's just um very easy in that regard but yeah i hear people all the time they'll say well it has nothing to do with the fact that you're just eating meat well the problem with that for me is that i know people specifically that have had very clean diets 
They're eating me- meat and veg, Mediterranean diet, very clean, whole food, no sugar, no junk food, no processed food, and they're still sick. And they don't get better until they cut out, like Michaela will tell you that. She was on meat and greens for a while, same with her father. They did not get better until they removed, you know, the the, the green stuff. And, and why is that? You know, you know my th- thought is their guts have been so compromised probably by the modern diet, you know, uh, the modern diet, at, you know, environment with, with all this just, you know, shelf-stable stuff with – all these ingredients that we, God knows what they do to our guts. And, and when our guts are compromised, it can't even tolerate simple things like, you know, like why would a piece of lettuce send somebody to, you know, like why would it, I think her dad said something about he had some apple cider vinegar and he was depressed for a month. I mean, that doesn't make sense. I mean, you're like, what the hell? That sounds crazy. Right. But I think there's, these people are uniquely compromised in their gut. And I think, I think most of the disease actually starts in our gut. I think it's pretty plausible. Um, I'm amazed when I hear gastroenterologists tell me that, yeah, Crohn's, they tell their patients, well, Crohn's has nothing to do with what you eat. Because I'll, I'll, I'll often get patients that have Crohn's disease or also colitis, and they'll start this diet, and within, you know, six months, they're like, hey, I'm off all my meds. I got no more symptoms. I'm not shitting myself 20 times a day. I don't have any bloody diarrhea anymore. I feel great. My life is back to normal. I, I had a colonoscopy. It said my gr- disease is gone. And still the doctor is saying, well, you just got lucky. There's nothing to do with diet. And I'm like, over and over again. The problem is they all go, they go to thousands of different doctors. They just need to go to the one guy over and over again, say, look, here's another one. Here's another one. And, and that's, you know, what I'm attempting to do, you know, by sharing this stuff on social media. Cause I, I you know, I'm not, I'm not making this stuff up. I mean, you know, I mean, yes, they could all be lying perhaps. I mean, perhaps every one of them that, that, that has a testimony has been lying and it's all Russian different disinformation bots and, you know, you know all the, the nonsense you hear, but I mean, it's, you know, it's legitimately happening. And it's something, Crohn's is such a debilitating condition, sure. or ulcerative colitis, all these things. And I mean, it, is it too much for people to just be told, hey, this might not work, but try it for a month, see how you go? Because the, anyone that I know that has Crohn's, they would do anything to go into remission from, I've seen people when they have flare-ups. And yeah. people who don't understand the condition can't even empathize with like the pain and the discomfort and the change of life that it causes to people and it really there should be some kind of gold standard that we can send people to because other people proclaim that fasting oh yeah you know george st pierre says you know fasting has changed my life telling people not to eat i'm like, well, like yeah. it probably is going to make your gut feel better because you're making it you know redundant of having to work but telling people to completely change what they're doing or at least to try different things out i think is such a a, a better way to kind of see and and, and attack issues where does the, when you were talking about meat, it's either meat or it's not. Where can, I'm always looking to muddy the waters. What about when you're looking into processed meats? Like when you see a yeah. sausage, is that in your camp or is that not? Well, I mean, it really. You know, you look at the ingredients like when you see what's in there. I mean, it depends. I mean, there's you know, there's old world processed sausage from from Europe where they you know it's it's animal products plus maybe some salt. I mean, that's probably okay. But you start looking at like. In the U.S., there's like Jimmy Dean and Moran. It's like this cheap, you know, the cheapest meat you can have with, you know, filled with wheat gluten and all the other crap in there. And that, that's certainly a problem, you know. And I think, you know, again, it depends on who you're dealing with. And, you know, if you have somebody with Crohn's disease or some other autoimmune issue, those people are going to really have a problem with this. You know, if it's somebody who just wants to lose weight and, you know, every once in a while they want to have a piece of pepperoni or, uh, you know, a piece of deli meat, that's probably fine for most people. I mean, but, again, it depends on you know, what's actually in it because that, and that's, that's the real, the, the real confounder here is, you know, processed mo- meat has been associated with various, you know, health conditions. Namely, they talk about things like uh, colorectal cancer. And I mean, the, the association is, well, what's in the processed meat? You know, is it, is it the fact that it's been processed with uh, sugar and nitrates and, you know, MSG? And I, I mean, I don't know, there's, there's all kinds of different things in there that are a problem. And, and, Often it's, you know, there's some kind of sauce and sugary sauces and things like that. So um, it really depends. Um, I, you know, I, I think the safe, I mean, if we're saying what is the safest thing, in, in my view, it's whole cuts of just, you know, ruminant meat, you know, beef or lamb. You know, in, in New Zealand, that's going to be the, the main, I don't know if can, I don't think kangaroo, I think I don't think a kangaroo is a ruminant, but it's, I understand it's a red meat. I've never had it. I mean, maybe you can comment on that if you've ever had it, but it sounds like it probably be fairly lean would be my guess. Yes, yeah, so it's pretty good, and you feel kind of uh, you feel good for eating it because there are so many of them here. They're they're in yeah, abundance, yeah. and like you know, culling the population, you feel like you're doing your bit. Now, I know you've been probably talked to death about this diet for so long. So, kind of one of the the way I wanted to finish our conversation would be talking about your non negotiables that have nothing to do with meat or red meat. So, you know, whether it be sunlight, stress, certain habits, like 
what are the kind of things because you're you're obviously a very capable athlete and you've got a lot of training experience so if i remove diet from the context what are your non-negotiables to people with their training lifestyle you know cuberman's very much like you know you can tell who's listening to their podcast they're like i'm getting sun in my eyes i'm getting 11 minutes cold water exposure what what are your things that you've kind of developed over the years well i mean i think that i mean consistency is probably the biggest thing i mean you know i think you know i mean the big the big three three things to me and if we exclude diet and i think diet is huge I think sleep and I think consistency of training are probably the top three things. And I think if you're doing that right, um, you know, if you want to sit there and, and gaze at the sun, it, 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 you know, at sunset or ground your feet in the morning or stand in front of a red light or, you know, hop in the cold plunge or whatever, that's all fine. But I mean, if you're not, if you don't have these three basic pillars, I mean, you're, you're just kind of you know, chasing your tail a little bit. So I think getting consistency of sleep, um, you know, training consistently and then good eating. That'll take care of probably, that's, you know, that's an 80-20 rule. That'll get you most of the way there. And then these other things, I've experimented with most of that stuff. I mean, yeah, I mean, you know, I live right now, it's kind of cold and it's not fun to go outside. You know, I got to put a jacket on and it's raining up near Seattle. And so it's like, you know, it's kind of sucks. But I came from Southern California where I could, you know, walk around outside without a shirt on half the time. But um, so I think that um, for... You know, I've tried. You know, I've done the ice baths. I enjoyed them. I think there's, you know, as you know, the research says don't do it right after a workout. You know, it's going to you know, potentially interfere with muscle protein synthesis. But those things are fun. I think you know the sauna. I've got a sauna at the house, and so I, I think all those things. But I, I, I can't say that I've, I've developed a pattern where every day without fail I do red light, or every day without fail I do, you know, you know, meditate or whatever. I mean, the things I've done over my lifetime, and I've, you know, I've been training for now, this is like 40, this is like going into my 44th year of lifting weights and training. I train, I lift, you know, it's some sort of exercise, whether it's weightlifting or sprinting or jumping, and I think that's important to stay active and, and mobile even into the, the older years. Uh, and, then, and then sleep is probably one that, I, you know, we all sleep, or we should. I mean, there's days where sometimes you don't get to sleep, but I mean, that, that's, those are the three that I've consistently found to be beneficial. And everything else beyond that is kind of, it's kind of faddish, I think. You know, it's kind of comes and goes. I mean, I, I guarantee you're not going to be jumping in the hot, in the cold plunge every day for the rest of your life. I mean, I'm, I'm, maybe you will. Maybe you'll prove me wrong, but you probably won't. You'll probably do it for a while, and maybe it'll come and go and that type of thing. And um, But, I mean, I think what you will do is you'll continue to eat, and you'll probably continue to train because, you know, you know once you – you know, once you've experienced the benefits, there's, it's rare that somebody that's trained most of their life just up and quits unless there's some dramatic health issue or injury or something like that. And then, of course, you're always going to sleep. So those are those really it. I mean, sleep, eat, and train. I mean, I think that's that's fine. And, you know, I mean, obviously, uh, I think we have too much fear-mongering around the sun. I mean, I know in, I remember in Australia, the ozone layer, and there was – you know, they're covering kids in, you know, tent cloths and things like that and spraying them down with all these <laughs> toxic chemicals to keep the sun off them. them. And so I think there is, you know, and this is, I don't know if you've heard this, in the carnivore community, it's kind of one of these weird observations. Some people will say that, you know, they are more sun tolerant. You know, they, they don't have the, they don't sunburn as easily because maybe they're not consuming, you know, whatever, something that maybe it's too much sugar. Maybe some people try to put the blame on canola oil or soybean oil or something like that. But, um, yeah, I mean, those are it. I mean, I'm just, just really basic things just are done consistently over time. It's not very exciting. It's not very flash. It doesn't sell a lot of, you know, product or anything like that, but it's just, you know, eat, sleep, train. Job. I'm, I'm like the biggest fan of Andrew Huberman, but like there is, he's actually incredible at bringing these like sexy different things out like magnesium three and eight and everyone's like three yeah. and eight what the fuck is three and eight like i need to order this well you know like it, there is like a romantic element to some of the advice he gives and then like you say when you say to someone be consistent because you could be doing this for four decades people go nah it's not it's not quite as sexy they're like there is a still perked up waiting for something else um I want to uh, personally thank you for coming on having this discussion. This discussion was just as much for me as it was for anyone that's going to listen or watch this. Uh, if people were going to want to see more of your work and, uh, you know, explore what you do, where would you send them? Well, I think for, first and foremost, I should mention Rivera.com. This is, this is, I mean, you go there and you, you link in. I'm, I'm there literally every day talking to, you know, I have a whole community of people. And I think one of the things when people are trying to make, uh, lifestyle change that they need support. And so I'm there to try to provide support for people. So Rivera.com, also carnivore.diet, it, it sends you to the same place. Uh, of course, I've got social media. I'm, I'm on Twitter. I'm S Baker MD. So capital S, capital B, and then A K E R, and then capital MD, S Baker MD 
on Twitter, and then I'm on Instagram. It's Sean Baker 1967. So S H A W N 1967. I've got a YouTube channel, and I believe I'm on TikTok as well. But I never, you know, I'm, I'm not. It's kind of it's kind of one of those things. I, I, TikTok to me is kind of a cesspool. I mean, I, I don't know. I kind of get on. I look at it. And I'm like, oh, I don't. It's, it's, I don't want to look at this stuff for some reason. But yeah, that's that's where I'm usually at. It's uh, it's interesting because I was very resistant to TikTok in the beginning because it's such short form that it, you know it's not good. You know this isn't good for minds. Like, I haven't got kids yet, but when I look, I think, fuck, I don't want them on that. Like, it, it's almost giving me an attention disorder just yeah. by utilizing it as a platform. And then the, these hits of dopamine that we can get with very little effort. And, you know, you haven't even got to get engaged with anything anymore. So, no, I completely uh, reason with you on that. I'll put all the links to the things that you've mentioned there in the description uh, below. But again, thank you for coming on. Fantastic chat. Uh, great to uh, have a talk with you and really appreciate you giving me your time. Well, thanks, James. I appreciate it. Let me know when you start. Or when you have a, do you have a start date where you're going to do this? And I'll, I'll have to follow along and see how things are going for you. I'll do it on the day that I drop the podcast and I'll commit to a month. And uh, okay. yeah, I'll be sharing the good, the bad and the ugly. Awesome. Well, hopefully, if there's anything you need me to help with, let me know. Just reach out and I'm happy to answer questions. So awesome. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you.